I'm going to call this meeting to order. Thank you, Your Worship. First item on this evening's agenda is the minutes of the regular council meeting held Monday, April 16th, with recommendation to approve. Moved by Councillor Reamer, second by Councillor Nicholson. All in favor, opposed, carried. Second item is uh, minutes of the sport council meeting held Wednesday, April 4th, recommendation to receive those minutes. Moved by Councillor Hodge, second by Councillor Asmussen. All in favor, opposed, carried. I have a business arising out of that committee's meeting concerns their work plan. Uh, the recommendation is that Council approve the 2012 Sport Council work plan as listed before you. <laughs> okay. Councillor Robinson moved. Councillor Nicholson second. All in favor, opposed, carried. Moving on to the items that were discussed at this evening's public hearing. The first one concerns bylaw 4296 2012. This is for 3465 Princeton Avenue and 1397 Kingston Street. The staff recommendations that Council give second and third readings to save Coquitlam Zoning Amendment bylaw 4296. Second. Moved by Councillor Asmussen, second by Councillor Reamer. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Item four. Concerns bylaws 4299, 4300, and 4301 2012. This is for 1319 Cartier Avenue. Uh, the staff recommendations that Council give second and third readings to City of Coquillum Citywide Official Community Plan Amendment Bylaw 4299. Moved by Councillor Reamer, second by Councillor O'Neill. Councillor Nicholson, please. Thank you, Your Worship. I'm going to look for some advice from staff as to how we might reasonably deal with the height issue um, not being on site and not having a measuring stick and all the rest of that stuff I'm, I'm reluctant to say okay no more than 20 feet above the grade of Hishi Avenue at the present whatever it is uh, perhaps we could start by staff could we first, where does that come from was that in some document presented earlier the suggestion that height at the roof peak would not be more than 20 feet above the road surface on Haiti or is that some design guideline where where does that spring from or do we know mr. McIntyre <clears throat> uh, yes thank you, your worship I, I believe in perhaps my staff the, the file manager that worked most directly with the applicant on this can can uh, clarify or, or uh, um, uh, but, um, or confirm this, but I think what I heard was that it was through the discussions between the resident, the neighbor across the street in, in discussion with uh, morning store staff, that they think there was some sort of understanding or, or uh, commitment to, to try to limit the height of that, that building at the top end of the development. And um, so that, that would not be a city requirement, I think as uh, uh, Raul mentioned earlier, it was to meet the RT2 zoning, that we, what we that would be the framework we would, we were working within. Now, if, if there's an interest of council to um, uh, to address that concern, um, and I think again, Raul sort of alluded to that earlier in his comments. If his direction from council to staff to work with the applicant uh, in the preparation of the development permit to bring it forward, looking at that that adjacency, that condition of how this site relates to the height of the the dwelling across the street. Um, I think we need more information around like, what the grade in that area is, what the horizontal dif distances are, um, what would the the building height that that last dwelling unit proposed at that end of the, of the site, how that would you know be sited there, and how that would affect the view angles of this resident to the uh, to the north. So that's. We can take that away and work with the applicant on that and have that information in greater detail on that when the development permit comes forward. And if, in fact, that 20 feet above factor is something that flowed out of the RT2 zoning designation, no? Okay, I'm sorry. I thought I heard you say that that was in the guidelines or somewhere. <clears throat> Again, uh, just to be clear, no, the, the framework we work with, work with is the RT2 zoning. It's a certain maximum height, I think it's 11 meters, but it's applying that to the specific site. So this the subject property has the benefit of being downhill from the resident. So let's see how that, that last house on that on the site would you know, be situated relative to the neighbor to the, the other side. 
So the zoning limit is 11 meters, and I, I don't think we need to give specific direction. It's, it's clear that at least one councillor is interested in preserving the views for those living just above and behind the property. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, but on that point, the, uh, the peak of that top house uh, is actually a north-south peak. Um, is it, do, do those numbers typically differentiate for a north-south peak or one that runs laterally across the slope, um, east-west in this case? Because obviously that would obstruct the view a lot more. Um, Mr. McIntyre. Uh, yes, Your Worship. Uh, I think Raul can uh, show on the overhead uh, to illustrate uh, the information. Thanks, Jim. Uh, your Worship, uh, yes, um, do I have a poor sketch? Um, this is a, a, previous, a previous sketch that I show actually extends beyond the property. Uh, the one uh, that you provided me, Mayor Stewart, doesn't actually extend beyond the road. Um, you can see on this sketch, um, and this was in the original public hearing package, um, that it shows where the road dedication would be, okay? So you can see where this property is relative to the existing. So you can see it's very, very likely that we'll meet the two stories at the property line. You can also see, as Mayor Stewart has pointed out, that the roof slope is taken away from the property to minimize the impact across the street. This is actually the road dedication on the top end, okay? Uh, six meters. Um, so we're, we're quite confident, we'll work with the developer to make sure that this remains a two-story elevation with the roof slope away from the uh, from the property to the north. That's uh, not what's shown. This is, a, this is an alternative. Yeah. So this, yes, and what, what I guess what I'm suggesting is that we can work with a proponent to bring an elevation on that, on that edge that might create a better interface with the property to the north and retain the elevation of two stories, which is the RT2 zone. I believe they can simply switch some of the elevations to make sure that that roof slope is more sensitive to the north. Thanks. There you go. I'll take mine back. Um, it's okay. Thank you, Councillor Nicholson. Councillor O'Neill. On the subject of, um, of views and the impact of views, it looks like a fairly um, I, I trust that the, the, the situation will be looked after regarding the size of the house and, the, and the how high the roof is. Uh, frankly, if I were across the street there to the north of this property, I might be more concerned with the height of the uh, trees that are planned to be planted there because along the north face of the, um, which the last graphic didn't show, there's going to be three uh, Deodora cedars. Um, Planted, and I know from personal experience those can get very, very, very high and very wide. Um, so while the house might be uh, very modest and uh, the roof line might be quite low, it will very soon be, and these things grow very quickly in this climate, uh, dwarfed by three Deodora cedars that are going to be in the area, which I think is significant. I don't have anything against the Deodora cedars; they're beautiful trees. But uh, that, that uh, if we're we're looking at issues. Uh, the trees will actually be a much bigger issue regarding views than uh, the house. So, three Deodora cedars, and you all know what those are? They're very big and wide. There you go. Okay. So, nobody's objecting to those, but yep. that's going to be that, what we'll hear from in five, ten years from now. Thank you for bringing your expertise on trees. Councillor Robinson. Thank you. Well, one of the things about this, um, this proposal is that it, it challenges the, the, um, the tension between infill development and maintaining green infrastructure. And I think we're going to see more of these kinds of uh, tensions coming before us um, as a community. Uh, we're seeing it certainly in Millardville. We're, gonna start, we're seeing it in Burquitlam, and we're going to be seeing it in um, 
uh, Ranch Park and in uh, Austin Heights. I think we're just going to be seeing it in, in all those areas. And this is a fabulous developer, and I think it's a lovely development. And I don't think we, as a city council, um, have given certainly direction to staff or to developers about what to do with that green infrastructure. I don't think we've given them um, the guidelines that um, I think expresses the value that this community has for trees. And not necessarily those kinds of trees, as uh, Councillor O'Neill mentioned, but for those heritage trees, the ones that have been around for 100 years. And heritage is not just a house that's been around for 100 years, but it's a tree that's been around for that long as well. It's a tree that will continue to, um, will, will not only continue to provide the shade and all the clean air and all of the, um, the water value um, that it, it brings in terms of keeping um, runoff from running terribly rampant into our streams, but it also provides um, existing shade. Uh, it, it'll take years for these trees to bring wildlife um, and to bring the assets that we value with, with our greenery. Um, so I don't blame the developer for this development. I think they're doing what we said that they can do. Um, but I'm disappointed that the developer doesn't see the mature, mature trees as a value when they, when they um, go to market. Um, I, I was looking at the drawings, and at the back of the, um, the artist's rendering are these beautiful um, mature trees. And I, I think that's what people are going to be looking at when they purchase, and that's the vision that they're going to have. But that's not going to be for years and years and years. And I think that's just uh, a bit misleading. Um, I don't want to sanitize the site because I do think that probably a lot of those trees are barriers to actually getting uh, infill development. But I'd like to see an attempt to at least protect some of the trees. At a minimum, a really good arborist report that says, um, you know, these are the trees that you absolutely must get rid of. These are the trees that you can probably work around because there's another 50 years left in them, um, that they are solid, solid uh, there and uh, you can build around them. Um, I've seen Vancouver do it. They, there are communities that are doing it and identifying important trees and building around them and recognizing that they add value, that they're not an afterthought, they're a forethought. Um, so I'm, I'm actually not comfortable supporting this application, um, and I think um, it's important that we start asking those questions. I know that I will start asking those questions. For each new redevelopment, so the developers out there, I'm going to be asking the questions. What are you doing for the trees that currently exist, and which ones are salvageable, which ones can you maintain and build into your development? Because I think the residents are going to start to get very, very cranky when they can no longer hear the birds in the morning, because that's what I hear in the morning in a well-established area where there's lots of mature trees. I hear the birds, and it's lovely. And when these trees come down, you're not going to be hearing that. So um, I'm, I'm not comfortable supporting it at this point. Thank you. Thank you. I've got some, um, some similar questions about the retention. Well, I'm looking at that large cedar at the northwest corner, for example. And I'm trying to understand, um, first of all, was it staff's direction that the uh, strata lane be a through lane, uh, that it, we had come at it from both ends? Um, Hatchie's not a particularly good local road, uh, um, whereas Cartier is actually, I think, a collector, or at least a, a well-traveled road. And I'm trying to understand why we wouldn't have simply allowed that lane to come up from the bottom and perhaps even lose some of the... Um, grade difference by sinking the top uh, the top home down a bit so that we end up with less grade on the on the lane and some retaining structure or something at the top such that we could retain the tree as well um, uh, like Councillor Robinson says there, are, there there's a work around there the tree I gather is on the road allowance um, and I um, and so I'm I'm just trying to that, that would do a couple of things. One, it would sink the top house, which is uh, advantageous for the view of the neighbors. And secondly, it would perhaps allow some of the, the makeup of that side-to-side -side split in the in the side-by-side -side dri driveways, the uncovered parking. Um, but and finally, it would make that that entire the 13 percent grade perhaps down to 11 or 10 um, by putting a retaining structure at the top of the lane and not requiring it to go through to Hatchie. 
Um, was consideration given to that, or is that the proponents wish that it be two-way, or what? Or is it a fire department requirement? Your Worship, um, it, the, the project was received um, by, from the proponent uh, as opening to both sides. Uh, staff did not dispute that. It, we, we had no discussion at all about making it a one-way system. Well, all of that is based, I mean, I, ultimately, I, I think I still preferred the courtyard option, and I recognize that um, the courtyard option probably would work really well if everybody drove a, a smart car or, or a Councillor Robinson's Mini but not everybody does and so that those are our challenges in trying to, to use it. design our driveways for full-size vehicles as well but I'm 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 at the end of this I think what we're going to do is reevaluate the heritage guidelines um, such that we can figure out whether um, they are a barrier to the kind of development that we we want and then uh, and including the courtyard option that I think may well have worked better on this site since it's the, the slopes are a significant Challenge. Councillor Reed dropped off. Did you? Yes, she did. Oh, okay. Councillor O'Neill. Yes, just um, a bit of extra information. Uh, Councillor Robinson talked about the trees that were visible uh, in between the units, uh, looking quite large. Um, and indeed, they will get quite large because my research shows that those are supposed to be a type of beech tree, uh, Fagus sylvatica. Uh, also known as Dock Hill Beach, and it grows to uh, typically 35, 25 to 35 meters tall, but it can actually max out at, a, at um, twice that. So those are gonna, they, they could be very large trees as well. Don't didn't get the number of years, and uh, just another general thing here because I think this is going to be a very beautiful development. Um, there are indeed uh, 20 new trees planned for the site. 10 street trees for a total of 30 trees, plus over 300 shrubs and hedges uh, going to be going in here. Because it's going to be very beautiful, very well landscaped, and I'm going to be supporting this. Thank you. Councillor Sikora. Yeah, thank you very much. <clears throat> One thing, you know, that bothers me tonight is the fact is that, you know, all of a sudden we've got this small little development. We're starting to cry about trees. Yet, a week ago, in our own park, you approved 200 and some trees to be re removed without any whimpers, without any cries, without any screaming, without anything. Right in our own park that we approved, as this council approved, 200 and some trees to be taken out. Now that really bothers me that all of a sudden we got 15 trees that are a great problem, you know. So it all depends when you attend the council meeting in these council chambers. Uh, what is it that's going to bother people uh, from week to week? And this is really bothersome to me, you know, Mayor. It, I can't, I can't believe it. But however, I hope that we do have the new plan for Millardville, for redevelopment of Millardville, and stick with it. 1987 plan is totally out of order, totally out of order. It should have been approved a long time ago, you know, we looked at and changed. But I hope that this, in May, we have open house, hopefully that the new plans come forward so the Millardville people can look at it and either accept it or reject it. But uh, they, they did want to have those seven homes. The seven homes disappeared into six. So I'm not going to get into it any further. And uh, let's leave it at that. But uh, certainly if any of the balas are 1987 or, or lower, or I, I think that they need to be looked at. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, on the question of trees, it also might depend on whether or not they're rotten. But uh, yeah, the so question so. is before us. It's uh, second and third reading. All in favor? All opposed? Councillors Hodge, Nicholson, Robinson, and myself are opposed. The motion carries. Staff recommendation two is that Council give second and third readings to see Coquitlam Zoning Map Amendment Bylaw 4300. Moved by Councillor Reamer, second by Councillor O'Neill. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Uh, sorry, Your, Your Worship, I wondered if Councillor Nicholson was in favor. Nope. 
And uh, I thought the same, but <laughs> it was, it was a, he, he didn't object. <laughs> uh, recommendation number three is that council give second and third readings to Steve Coquitlam Zoning Text Amendment Bylaw 4301. Moved by Councillor Rasmussen, seconded by Councillor Sikora. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. And finally, recommendation four is to give fourth and final reading to see Coquitlam Zoning Text Amendment Bylaw 4301. Okay. Moved by Councillor Sikora, seconded by Councillor Reamer. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Item 5 pertains to bylaws 4304 and 4305. This is for 652 Harrison Avenue. The first staff recommendation is that Council give second and third readings to see Coquitlam Citywide Official Community Plan Amendment Bylaw 4304. Second. Moved by Councillor Reamer, second by Councillor Reed. Sorry, moved by Councillor Reed, second by Councillor Reamer. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Recommendation two is to give fourth and final reading to save Coquillam Citywide Official Community Plan Amendment Bylaw 4304. Second. Moved by Councillor Asmussen, second by Councillor Reamer. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Recommendation three is to give second and third readings to the City of Coquillam Zoning Amendment Bylaw 4305. Second. Moved by Councillor Reamer, second by Councillor Asmussen. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. And finally, to give fourth and final reading to save Coquillam Zoning Amendment Bylaw 4305. Moved by Councillor O'Neill, second by Councillor Asmussen. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Item 6 is fourth and final reading of Vector Control Bylaw 4284 and Bylaw Notice Enforcement Amendment Vector Control Bylaw 4285. Staff recommendation is to give fourth and final reading to Vector Control Bylaw 4284 and fourth and final reading to Bylaw Notice Enforcement Amendment Bylaw 4285. Moved by Councillor Asmussen, second by Councillor Robinson. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Item 7 is the fourth and final reading of delegation of authority bylaw 4286. Staff recommendations give fourth and final reading delegation of authority bylaw 4286. Second. Moved by Councillor Robinson, second by Councillor Reamer. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. <coughs> Item 8 is a transit oriented development strategy, the TDS, in its proposed work plan. Uh, staff recommendations that Council endorse the proposed work plan as outlined in the report and direct staff to proceed with immediate initiation of the TDS. We have a staff presentation on this item. Your Worship, if I could, just a, a few opening remarks. Um, um, Council Mayor Call, it wasn't, wasn't too long ago we uh, we came forward with a report uh, at that time was uh, more focused around the Burquitlam area and the number of uh, OCP amendment applications we had received and uh, uh, direction was provided back to staff. And part of the program, at the, the proposed program at that time was to, to deal with this, um, this opportunity but also the challenge of uh, uh, the Evergreen SkyTrain system coming to Coquitlam, Coquitlam City Centre, um, to do it maybe a little bit different way. And, um, and that's the first piece of work that Bruce will speak to here in a moment and that's what we're calling a, a transit oriented development strategy so that's looking at the big picture looking at the evergreen corridor from one end to the other particularly focusing on the station areas and at that sort of high level um, view looking at what uh, possible um, uh, principles you know planning and transportation principles and policies that we could see citywide that would then uh, be applied within each of the neighborhood plan areas. So this is the one piece of work that uh, we're getting underway with, as, as was our commitment. Um, just uh, very briefly for Council's uh, recollection, the other two streams are also, uh, well, the first is underway and the second will be, the third will be uh, commencing very shortly. That was dealing with the, the package of OCP amendment applications in Burquitlam, and that, that work will be uh, uh, carrying on in parallel, but also being uh, assisted by this, this, the, the TDS piece. And the third um, would be, again, uh, looking at the opportunities within Burquitlam, and certainly given the high level of, of both development activity we've seen so far, plus the interest in going back and, and uh, revisiting and updating that neighborhood plan. So that would be the third piece of work. So I just want to put that in context. And I'm also very pleased to uh, uh, welcome back, uh, if only for a short period of time, our former uh, uh, community planning manager who uh, accepted um, our request, my, my personal request, that he take on this assignment uh, given his recent uh, work with the city and his knowledge in this area. So uh, I'll turn it over to Bruce to do a presentation around the TDS. Bruce, we've missed you so much. Yeah. <laughs> 
With, uh, with respect to counsel, I'll try to be as, as quick as I can, mostly for respect to counsel and fear of Mrs. Stewart. Uh, I am anticipating a few questions, though, um, but I will try to be as close as I can, sir. Um, through the chair, thank you, counsel. I am equally pleased to be here um, tonight. Um, equally pleased because truly this is, is one of those exciting projects that as a planner you really look forward to and it's a great time for Coquitlam. What we of course have is an opportunity, a very exciting opportunity and a very challenging opportunity. The chance for Coquitlam to establish a multiple number of high level policy pieces that will support some vibrant urban nodes around the station areas. We do have to uh, do quite a bit of planning in this regard but the opportunities um, if we get this right are truly uh, a game changer for Coquitlam. The purpose of the project that I'm speaking to you tonight and the framework we're trying to deliver from a policy standpoint, as Jim introduced, is to ideally try to deal in a coordinated fashion with some of the higher level policies that would ordinarily um, uh, be consistent across the stations if you would and as opposed to try to deal with them one on one trying to deal with those items that are consistent um, in a more coordinated fashion. Some goals that we really have to concentrate on that we're working on already is greater interdepartmental coordination really leveraging the stations not just for the stations themselves but for exactly what they are which are real citywide assets. We need to make sure that we're consistent with the policies that we apply where that's appropriate and the guidelines we set for not only the stations but the corridors that surround them and that we need to make sure that as fast as we can, we create certainty, both for our development industry and also our community, so they know with confidence what to expect of this area. To do that, we are certainly going to try to form a policy that will direct future policy development and inform those applications that would come in those areas. Our goals initially, while still to be worked out, um, certainly areas that we're, we're starting to look at in terms of our objectives, are to make sure that those areas in a corridor or directly related to a station have an appropriate mix of land use. This is key to the vitality and vibrancy of the area. Certainly this has very much been on Council's mind that we have appropriate density around such an asset. With appropriate density, the more density you have, the greater emphasis must be placed on a higher quality urban design. That also includes a quality amenity space for the areas. Many of our stations are going to be going into areas um, that the city is quite, quite uh, convinced need a great deal of amenities provided to them. And of course, connectivity, good pedestrian connections from that corridor um, around the stations for people to use the asset and obviously manage uh, growth appropriately um, for Coquitlam. That's a, a long list and quite a challenge and we've picked up the challenge that Council's put before us to try to do this in a, in a very unique way. Primarily the challenge was to make sure that we would optimize the current and very fast approaching opportunities. For a long time Evergreen felt on again, off again. With the certainty we have now that opportunity is coming much faster than we could really have imagined. We need to of course best coordinate and manage applications that are already in front of our uh, development approvals group. And of course the goal to build a vibrant, well served community um, around those stations without undue delay and the tricky balance is of course to make sure that we don't take any unnecessary risks. To do that we're suggesting a four layered approach. Our first layer as Jim introduced and was previously discussed as part of the March 19th meeting is we will develop a high level transit oriented development strategy. We intend to do this very quickly. We intend to do this on some of the larger policy pieces. We will then turn to the interim Burquitlam OCP applic applications um, that are already at work with our crew um, and make sure those two pieces relate to each other and understand and learn from each other. Our Burquitlam neighborhood plan remains just as important as it always did. Uh, there's nothing in our program that's suggesting we are trying to favor a spot zoning but rather well planned coordinated uh, changes as we grow forward. And then with Burquitlam it's important for the longer term to note that we will need to come back to city center, complete some of the work that we uh, interrupted in 2008 and eventually turn to the low heat area as well uh, to make sure we're taking advantage. Obviously um, some of the scope that we'd be looking to tackle when I talk about what is a high level approach, some of the items that we feel very important about around close areas to the stations are building height and the transition of density towards uh, other uses. The land use interface very much as further you move out from that station how it relates to the existing communities. The public realm environment, very important as these play, as station areas really need to become places. They become something with their own identity being very crucial. 
We do have a large amount of rental stock, especially around some of our stations. We do need to think comprehensively of how the city wishes to deal with that. And we obviously need to think about the asset appropriately with parking. Uh, we don't want to apply a, a purely suburban standard around these assets, but we do want to get our numbers right. And also how these particular assets can work um, to forwarding our aspirational goals around employment um, in Coquitlam. Some of the tools that we're going to try to investigate and have already started investigating is, is what is an appropriate density bonus piece and how can we look at a community uh, amenity contribution in the areas. Um, starting in the idea of amenities, I mentioned this is very important to certainly some of the community. Uh, community. Um, how, how can we sort of outline the principles of how we might approach that and some of the first ideas um, that we would suggest to get that right. And holistic servicing, what we mean by that is making sure that no individual opportunity um, cancels out opportunities for others to make sure we have a complete and developed area. And certainly getting some of our first ideas around a design principle. One of the first things we'll come back to you in May is a more precise definition of what do we mean by study area. Um, we think that's actually context specific. We think we have a certain and limited number of stations and we want to be very specific about that. We don't think one size fits all. But we do think there's some principles involved. And the principle as illustrated here is obviously there's greater intensity as you get right close to that station. And as we move away from that station, it's very much about interface and it's very much about how we relate to that community and connect into the core. I apologize, Council, when we're talking about all three projects, I know that this cannot be seen. That's why in big bold we said an attachment. We tried this chart about five different ways. But we are trying to do three processes at once. And you can imagine we have sort of a day-by-day -day calendar on this and it looks a lot uglier. So I would beg your indulgence to look at the uh, attachments you have. At a high level, what I suggest to you in terms of principles with this is here we are today looking for endorsement of a work plan that is very ambitious. Uh, it is quite, uh, quite unique in terms of planning of, of, of these type of places. We intend to bring back our first policy set to you in a month. We intend at that time to continually work with our applications and inform them and bring back those policies um, with you reporting through committee um, and at the same time if council feels comfortable we're going to check with our work plan again. If our early drafts seem appropriate and if council is comfortable with the, wor with the work plan, we'll proceed to um, two open houses, different areas of the city that are affected by uh, the TOD corridor. And at the same time, we'd also start looking for more detailed feedback from our developers um, uh, who are interested in developing around this area, not just those who uh, currently have applications. The feedback of that open house public consultation, the feedback from our industry would come back to council in July. And should we have everything right, we will continue on a more expedited process. That process would allow us to reconcile new policies with the current applications. It would allow us to get deeper in investigation with the servicing for any applications. And it would provide great information to the neighborhood plans, ideally piloting with Perquitlam. Should we feel at that time that our feedback, either from administration, council, the public, or developers, doesn't give this council great comfort, Again, we could continue to a more typical timeline. So if you will, we're, we're looking at that process by checking in with you three times uh, in short order um, as we are aware we are going a little faster than we would standardly go. I bet I'll come back to questions. Um, some of the potential variables that we've highlighted um, for you is that by going on our uh, higher level policies, we will not have some of the same timelines that we sometimes do with that. We are, however, blessed with a great deal of best practices from across the country um, on what's to draw on. We are also not starting from scratch. Um, we have some uh, transit development guidelines already passed going back to 2002 and 2008 in the city that we need to look at and make sure are fresh enough. Um, we will bring those forward and, of course, for review and public consultation. This does, however, present a shorter time frame than sometimes some of our policy discussions um, do happen. And in order to monitor that, that's why we're trying to come back to you three times in short order to check our, our timelines. And with checking in with Council, the work plan is today. Our preliminary policy <coughs> workshop with committee would be in early June. And our project <coughs> update report and feedback from the open houses and the developers would be in July. Following that, of course, any applications that are going forward um, that are outside of a current OCP require their own full public consultation um, program as set by our development planning staff in consultation with the industry. And finally, following that, 
our neighborhood planning process as it goes, as Council is well aware, has a very extensive um, consultation process that would kick in, in uh, first in the Burke-Whitlam case to deal with more uh, site-specific and community-specific issues. Our request today is that Council um, investigate this work plan and ideally endorse this work plan and allow us to proceed immediately as we are uh, geared to go and we do understand the challenge before us. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you very much. A lot of work there. Councillor Robinson. Thank you. Um, I'm actually blown away because I know that I was very anxious about how, we, how are we going to do all this and here you have a plan. You make it seem so simple in a complicated sort of way or complicated <laughs> in a simple sort of way. Um, I, I'm, I'm actually pleased to see this um, sort of come before us so quickly and I thank you very much for that. I have a couple questions about the public engagement part of this. Um, because of the shortened timeline, um, will there be, I'm assuming, a bit less, it's, it'll be tighter in terms of consulting with the public. And I want to make sure that we cast that net far and wide, even though I know we do that all the time. Um, I'm thinking about um, um, sort of using some more social media, um, making sure that we get website. Um, I, I, in, there was actually one a uh, place where you talk about consultation and in late June there's a public open house to introduce the process. But I, th I think it needs to be lots of website input. I, people, in terms of traffic, I would, I'm wondering if we can have an alert on our website that whenever, whenever someone goes to it, there's an alert that pops up. I don't, something creative that s just sort of says, we want your opinions on and direct them to the consultation process. I'm just concerned that we, we could because we're, we're fast tracking this for good reason, because Evergreen Line is coming through, the, that train has left the station, and we, literally. <laughs> literally, and we're doing a bit of catch up, which I think we, we have to do, and we, so we do need to act quickly. I don't want to shorten the public consultation piece too much, like, so I want to just make it bigger. Even, and I hate this, but I'm even thinking, give us your opinion and you enter a chance to win an iPod. I don't know, I hate that, but it's just, Okay, a free, pass, sw free swimming pass, I don't know, something, annual pass, something that would motivate people to get off their tuchus and tell us what they think. And as Council is aware, we've been um, incredibly comprehensive in terms of some of the consultation we've been doing in our neighborhood plans uh, with Mayardville, with uh, Partington recently. I know there were two events just in the last 10 days. Um, I'd be glad to talk in more detail with Mr. McIntyre and Mr. McDonald to develop a, a communication plan to do the best we can within this time frame. I think there are some things, I mentioned some other best practices. Um, the web is a good example. Um, some things that a number of other municipalities done have done sort of short primers on specific issues. For example, uh, when we see strong density come to your transit station, most cities are not seeing increase in traffic because the mode split is actually being achieved. So we're seeing a lot of people use these, these, uh, uh, the actual rail facilities once they're in. I think that's important information to get out, and I think the web is a good vehicle. But I'll, I'll need to work with uh, Mr. McIntyre and Mr. McDonald to see what we can do in the time frame. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Seeing no other speakers. Move recommendation. Second. Moved by Councillor Reamer, second by Councillor Asmussen. Discussion? All in favor? I thank Mrs. Stewart for that. All opposed? <laughs> yeah, we'll give her credit for that one. A tremendous amount of work. I want to thank staff for, for putting that together. That motion carries unanimously. Councillor Reed absent. Thank you, Your Worship. I'm moving on to item nine. It's the pesticide use control bylaw. Um, Multi-part recommendation, first part is to allow an exemption from the requirements of the proposed bylaw to the Fraser Pacific Rose Society for the purposes of transitioning their garden. Direct staff to provide council with a status update in approximately two years time on this progress. Amend the City of Coquitlam Pesticide Use Control Bylaw 4254 to delete the requirement on pesticide vendors to display the notice attached to Schedule B to the bylaw at every point of sale terminal. Give fourth and final reading as amendment to City of Coquitlam Pesticide Use Control Bylaw 4254 and first, second, and third readings to Bylaw Notice Enforcement Amendment Pesticide Use Bylaw 4307. 
Okay, I'll take that as Councillor Reamer moves the recommendation. Councillor Asmussen seconds. Councillor O'Neill. Thank you. Um, I certainly support uh, the exemption for the Pacific Fraser Rose Society, and I also support the amendment uh, to delete the requirement on pesticide vendors to display the notice. Uh, but I can't support the overall um, bylaw. And, uh, you know, I've spoken about this before. And, um, um, and uh, essentially, my earlier, longer uh, dissertation on this, I talked about how it, I, I think it viewed, uh, it sort of represented the precautionary principle run amok. And tonight I want to focus on another aspect. If you turn to page um, two of the council report, you see the strategic goal. Now, uh, we've sort of got boilerplate here that we have this in just about every report, and, and, uh, and, and, and it says how this bylaw reflects corporate strategic goals. And in this specific instance, it says it uh, reflects the uh, strategic goals of achieving excellence in city government, of strengthening neighborhoods, of enhancing sustainability of city services and infrastructure. You know, I went through these one by one, and I don't see how it actually achieves any of these things. Achieving excellence in city governance. Well, is this what you call it when a city council commissions a costly expert study and then ignores that costly expert uh, study's principal recommendation, which is to establish a permitting process, and then attempts, of course, to implement a near complete ban? Um, and how exactly is excellence achieved by implementing a bylaw of such magnitude without coming to grips with the possible um, fairly substantial financial implications it carries? Now, if we are ever to move towards um, active enforcement, there's a ticket price there that we don't deal with. And according to page 7 of this report, it could cost the city up to $1 million over 10 years in extra labor costs to manually tend to weed-impacted planting beds. It's $1 million. Um, I don't think that's excellence in city governance. I think that's extravagance in city governments. So scratch off number one for a strategic goal being met in my books. Then you look at strengthening neighborhoods. Now, if one believes the conjecture that the ban will make our residents healthier, then you might say that this is the case. But of course, when viewing the hard evidence from Health Canada, which suggests that properly used pesticides are not dangerous in the first place, it's hard to see how banning them can improve residents' health. On the other hand, as I previously noted uh, several weeks ago, neighborhoods might actually be weakened insofar as a ban would lead to more weeds growing in the city. Adverse health risks associated with respiratory afflictions would increase, as I previously noted, uh, in connection with a report from the City of Toronto. And moreover, um, general feelings of well-being may decrease. Uh, recall that J Dr. James Liu, medical health officer for the Co Vancouver Coastal Health Unit, wrote in February 2009 a letter to Richmond Council that the aesthetics of urban landscapes make has a public health value. That's a quote. What he's saying is flowers, not weeds, make people happy. This has a beneficial health effect. Because of this, he said, quote, a comprehensive integrated pest management approach offers a better alternative to cosmetic pesticide bylaws. An IPM strikes a balance between prudence, public policy, and private choice. I couldn't have said it better. And then, of course, back to that possible $1 million price tag for strengthening, uh, do you think extra spend expenditure of $1 million does anything to strengthen any neighborhood? What services will be lost, or how much will taxes have to be raised to pay for that? Either way, it's hard to see how neighborhoods will be strengthened by overtaxing property owners or slashing services to cover the costs that seem to be inevitable. We'll get to the third one, enhancing sustainability of city services and infrastructure. Well, insofar as the bylaw essentially exempts the city from having to stop using weed killers on the city's playing fields and medians, and will probably include an exemption for the Pacific Rose Garden too. One wonders how this is to be interpreted. If you take a closer look at this, at face value, we're led to believe that a bylaw that allows the use of cosmetic pesticides on city property somehow enhances sustainability. Logically, though, if this is so, it must also be true that the bylaw, which has an opposite effect on private property, 
must also have an opposite outcome on private property when measuring sustainability. Bizarrely, this would lead us to conclude that the ban would have an unsustainable impact on that private property. It can't be sustainable for both when the law, as it's going to apply regarding the use of pesticides, is diametrically opposed. So one or the other, it's got to be unsustainable. You can't have it both ways. Allowing usage on city property and disallowing use on private property can't be sustainable at the same time. Now, uh, in reviewing the impact of the bylaw on the corporate strategic goals, and it's highly questionable whether excellence in city government has been achieved. It's doubtful that neighborhoods have been strengthened, and it's impossible to determine whether city services and infrastructure will enjoy enhanced sustainability. In conclusion, uh, and sticking with uh, the irony that I've been talking about above, um, I must draw attention to a letter dated February 24, 2012, and signed by Vern Cousy, Acting Manager of Environmental Services, in which he responds to questions from the BC Cancer Society about the aforementioned city fields exemption. In defense of that exemption, Mr. C uh, Cousy declared, and I quote, you should be aware that our Parks Department only uses products that have been authorized by the relevant federal health agencies responsible for researching and approving their use and only as permitted under provincial regulations. That's ironic, of course, because absent any city bylaw banning the use of cosmetic pesticides on private lawns, every citizen of Coquitlam could make exactly the same statement that they only use products that have been authorized by the relevant federal health agencies responsible for researching and approving their use and only as permitted under provincial regulations. But they're not allowed to do that because we're banning them. So it seems that the city deems itself responsible enough to make this argument but it's concluded that average citizens and property owners are, as a whole, completely irresponsible. You know, this is actually beyond ironic. It's insulting to the average citizen of Coquitlam. And it's discriminatory, too, because it prejudges citizens and finds them all guilty of reckless and unhealthy pesticide use. So it should come as no surprise that I will reiterate my opposition to this bylaw on the grounds that it is expensive, illogical, unscientific, and unfair to the citizens of Quitlam. Would you like me to continue? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I'm not sure we could stop you if you had more stuff, but we're glad you had so much fun writing that. <laughs> Councillor Robinson. Thank you. Well, we are finally here at fourth reading, and I surprisingly have lots to say. Um, in, in response to some of uh, Councillor O'Neill's comments, I want to remind him that it's the same federal government that um, confirmed that thalidomide was absolutely a safe product for pregnant women to use that resulted in uh, a whole generation, certainly months, of uh, babies born with uh, challenged limbs. It's uh, the same federal government that certainly said that smoking was uh, not harmful to our health. So you'll have to bear with me if I have a bit of skepticism about what the federal government says is safe. I also want to acknowledge that you're wearing your, your, your um, Cancer Month pin, which is, which is great. And um, there's certainly lots of um, evidence to support the likelihood that uh, pesticide use does increase the incidence of cancer. So um, pardon me if um, you think I'm being disrespectful of citizens, but I have a responsibility to, in, to promote uh, good public policy that keeps in mind good public health. And uh, from a personal property rights perspective, I want to make sure that my property, where I grow my food, uh, doesn't, isn't contaminated with pesticides. So the only way that I can be assured of that is if my neighbors not spraying pesticides, perhaps following all the rules, doing it properly, doing it with really good intentions, but until they can figure out a way to keep their pesticides on their property, I have the right to grow food on mine, and I think that having a uh, cosmetic use ban is the way to do that. So having said that, um, I do have some concerns with the amendment that staff um, are recommending that has to do with the signage issue. Um, I'm not comfortable with it. Uh, staff, I believe, were doing this in response to uh, a delegation that came before us at the end of March, um, a, a delegation that represented uh, one retailer 
saying that this, uh, that signage at point of sale was going to be a challenge and that it was going to be uh, messy and that it was not actually going to add any benefit given that they already had a system in place that, uh, inform, that would inform residents and ask residents if they knew how to use the product safely, which I understand they're required to do by uh, provincial legislation, um, and that they would be able to inform residents uh, at that point or re remind them that there is a ban in the city of Coquitlam. Well, in the interim, um, a resident drew uh, my attention to the fact that she tested the system and the system didn't work. And so I went and I tested the system. I went and yes, I bought pesticides. I apologize, I've returned it today. <laughs> I was hoping no one would see me do it, but uh, I tested the system and I was not asked anything. I was not asked if I understood how to use the product, I was not asked anything. And so what that said to me was that um, retailers may have the best intentions and they may be prepared to do all kinds of things, but it doesn't mean that they, that they do it. And I'm not even sure that if we ask them to put up signs that they'll do it. But I think that uh, this was a recommendation that we ought to get word out to our residents um, that uh, as many points of opportunity to do that. And so I'm actually not comfortable uh, removing that requirement because I think staff were trying to be very responsive and I was prepared to be very responsive. I thought, yeah, I suppose that's okay. Uh, but actually that's not the case. And since uh, there were three attempts, actually three tests of the system and they all failed. The other thing I did was I talked to another retailer and I asked for their opinion if this really would be problematic. Would it really be a big issue at the point of sale to place a sign that says, you need to know, dear consumer, the city of Coquitlam has a bylaw that does not allow, permit the use of cosmetic pesticides. And I was told that no, it's not a big deal. They put signs up all the time for many different things and this would be one more sign that it really was not a big inconvenience to the retailer. So given that that's the case, um, I'm not comfortable uh, supporting item three, so I would move that we separate um, so that uh, those of us who are not comfortable with it can, uh, can, can vote against that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll separate, but we'll uh, continue with the debate as though they were together and vote on them separately. Councillor Nicholson. Thank you, Your Worship. I took a look at the report. It says 40000 to 100000 a year, a million dollars over 10 years. Gee, we could make it $100 million. But all we have to do is change the number of years. But it's forty to a hundred thousand dollars a year in additional cost to maintain our gardens, our plants in the city. That's a public health cost. It's what it will cost us to try to maintain, preserve the health of the people of Coquitlam. When I moved to Coquitlam in seventy six, I had an open ditch beside my house. I think it was Councillor then. I don't know whether you were Councillor Mayor, Lou, but you promised to fill in all the ditches. That was cost a lot of money, but it was a public health issue. This is a public health issue. We have to do it. We have to look after ourselves, our children, my grandchildren. Well, they live in Port Moody, but they already have a band. So the cost for us to garden versus the the cost, the public health costs, is a no-brainer to me. So I support the ban. But I want to talk for a minute about the Fraser Pacific Rose Society. They came to see us and they made a great case and they have a beautiful garden. And they're moving already towards using disease-resistant plants and won't need to use pesticides. They're a great bunch of people, and I think they do a great deal of good work. They produce a garden that's a great tourist attraction, brings a lot of people to Coquitlam. It's, it's really important, that garden. It's a beautiful thing. But and I also believe them that they're acting responsibly and <coughs> moving towards having disease-resistant plants exclusively in their garden. But I think the way we're approaching it 
is not the right way to do it. And I would, I don't, can, can we go back one slide, Mr. Gilbert? To, so I, I would move to amend recommendation one to allow an exemption for two years from the requirements of the proposed bylaw. And look for a seconder to that. Thank you. I expect that at the end of two years, we might have a further delegation from the Fraser Pacific Rose Society. We might have a report from staff as to the pr progress that's been made. Please but do. I want the responsibility to lie where it belongs. And that's with the people who seek the exemption. Thank you. Okay, we're going to have to enable another Q. Yep. QB has been enabled. Okay, does anyone have any comments or questions on the proposed amendment? It's been moved by Councillor Nicholson, seconded by Councillor Robinson. I have one question. I assume the amendment deletes number two since it would be redundant. We weren't. We're, 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 deba we're debating them all now. The amendment is to move and to change to number one and delete number two, recommendation number two. Um, any speakers on the amendment? Councillor Reamer. Me. Councillor Reamer, on the amendment. Thank you. Um, I, I don't have a problem uh, with this amendment. However, I am wondering if then we could get a report after one year to see how things are going for the two years. Would you be open to that? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to take the amendment as being uh, the amendment to one and the, uh, the amendment to one year for an amendment to make it one. Two years is now one year in recommendation two. Um, Councillor Reed. It's getting more confusing all the time. Well, if Councillor Robinson accepts that, then I, we're dealing with a single amendment. I've taken it as one. Okay. I, I, my only comment was going to be that um, these are our citizens, our folks, our beautiful garden, and they came and they told you what they were doing, and I think we should take them at their word because I believe that um, this group will do exactly what they said they're going to do. So by now putting more pressure on them, I just, I, I just don't think that's a dignified way of doing business. Thank you. Councillor Sikora. Yeah, thank you very much. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> We're talking about good health, public health. Yet, how are you going to enforce this so, and say it's good public health? You can't enforce any one of these bylaws. Uh, Councillor Sikora, this is only on the amendment. Well, I'm sorry, Mayor. I had my, my button down we, we, to speak before you took the amendment. And the speakers have a right to speak before the amendment is taken. But we've enabled you the cannot, You cannot take amendment in the middle of uh, when you, there's a, a number of council members wish to speak. Well, we've enabled a different queue for the amendment because this is in our council procedure bylaw that you voted on. Uh, well, you know, somebody had my, my button on I, to speak and you erased it off. I didn't. The, the clerk did. He enabled the well, second. Okay. Well, I'm sorry. You want to use guys. But, but you're still on the queue. You're still on the queue to speak. Once the amendment has been has been dealt with, because right now we're, we're there's a motion to amend that takes precedence over the main motion and takes precedence over speaking queue of the main motion. We've set that aside. We've enabled another queue. Um, you're now on it, but do uh, you, ha you have anything to say on the amendment? I will not be supporting it. Okay. okay. That's what I got to say. Okay. <laughs> Councillor Reamer. Thank you. Thank you again. Um, having heard what Councillor Reed has said. Um, my understanding was when the Rose Society came forward that staff were going to um, present us with some options and I gather that these are the options that we've been presented with. So I have a question for staff with respect to how long um, does the Rose Society or yourselves think it's going to take um, to go um, to transition the Rose Garden to disease resistant roses? Yeah, your, your Worship, uh, our, our, I guess, educated guess was in the ballpark of two to three years, and that is why we suggested uh, that kind of time frame. Uh, Kathy Reinheimer in the Parks Department, though, may have some, uh, some better direct information. Thank you. Ms. Reinheimer. 
Your Worship, my suspicion that it might be a fair bit of time considering the breeding is happening internationally and the time it takes to get new introduction plants that have that meet the criteria for fragrance and color and flower form is fairly un unpredictable. So I would say we're talking about at least five to ten years. Okay, um, I am going to change my position on uh, supporting that amendment. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Well, that's the purpose of debate is to quite often sometimes, rather sometimes, can convince each other. I have the same concern. I think that um, uh, the group that came before us uh, came before us with a good, good heart, trying, trying to manage through a, an investment that they as a community have put into an, am an amazing amenity for Coquitlam, uh, a rose garden that is uh, without question of an amazing quality, an excellent quality across the Lower Mainland and, and quite renowned. Um, but and they made a commitment that they would be converting that uh, to the extent that they could um, convert that to uh, disease resistant roses. Uh, we then I think council s suggested that it was the best the best approach was to give them time to do that and not give them one year or give them two years but give them time to do that and I fully expect that they're going to do it as quickly as reasonably possible but there are hundreds of beautiful, expensive plants in that rose garden that um, that they've been caring for and uh, they want to transition. I think it's. Uh, I think the original motion, the original recommendation was, give them two years, have them report back. If after two years we don't think they've done enough, we could always turn off the tap and say no, there's no more uh, pesticides, and and then the roses die. I. I don't think that's where we're going to see what we're going to see. I think we're going to see after two years some great progress. We're going to see a time frame, and they're probably even going to have a, a, a plan, month by month and year by year, for how we get to where we have a disease-resistant rose garden. And I'm fully prepared to give them that uh, le that length of time. I'll be voting against the amendment, Councillor Hodge. Yes, I was um, I was happy when they when they came for us uh, when the Rose uh, uh, Society came came to us and, and one of the things that impressed me with the presentation was the fact that they wanted to move towards uh, the disease resistant roses and and they spoke about um, trying to cultivate new varieties they said it was going to take some time but they also expressed a willingness to not only convert over to to the new roses and to start practicing what I would call maybe best practices in terms of, of, of rose gardening, but I also saw it as a chance that other citizens could follow and learn from their example as they made the transition. And, and I think that we have to give them time to do the transition. Um, I also think that, uh, that one of the things that they may be up against is we don't know what's going to happen at the provincial and federal um, level. And we could, in the very near future, on, on relatively short notice, see a province-wide or a federal ban on the sale and use. So they themselves Themselves, I think are probably realizing that they're going to have to pick this up because they're, they're getting uh, an extension from us, but that extension may not be for longer than a year or two years. So I think that it's in their best interest, and I'm sure that this is what they will do, is to move as quickly as, as they can. So I, I'm comfortable. Uh, I'm glad that we've, we've allowed an exemption for them so that they can begin the conversion. And, and I'm comfortable that, uh, that they're going to move quickly, and uh, so I will uh, not be supporting the, the amendment. And a quick clarification, I believe they told us they'd already begun the conversion. They, and they have, and it's, it's underway now. Yeah. Councillor Roberts. Thank you. Um, I, I really appreciate um, Councillor Hodge raising that because I was making that note uh, myself that this may be moot. This, uh, I'm really, I'm praying I'm from, from, from Councillor Hodge's mouth to the government's, the province's ears, should they bring in a ban that would make a lot of this moot. Um, so. I, and I don't want to be, if I can say this, a hard ass on this. Um, can I say that? The Yiddish word. Tuchus. And I'm and I'm allowed to say no. You're not allowed to say that. <laughs> um, you know, these, these are, and I appreciate. I'm a gardener, and it breaks my heart to even thin my plants that I'm supposed to thin, and it it, it breaks my heart to lose plants. So, I don't I don't want to create hardship for them. So um, even though I, I mean I seconded it, I, I don't want to turn this into an issue and I don't want it to be divisive. Um, I think these folks are doing their very best to transition and 
this two-year time frame, I suspect, may be, um, may be moot. And so I don't want us to bear that. So I'm, I'm actually not going to support the amendment. Sorry, Councilor Nicholson. <laughs> because well, I just, I don't think it's worth it. Well, under our rules, the only one that's not allowed to change his mind is the person that moved the motion. <laughs> so you're on your own. <laughs> Seeing Seeing no other speakers, I have to call the motion and call the question. The question is the amendment to uh, two years maximum. All in favor? <laughs> if John Carroll can do it, so can we. All opposed. The motion fails with councillors Hodge, Nicholson, Reed, Sikora, Asmundson, Reamer, Robinson. <laughs> And O'Neill and myself okay. all opposed. The motion fails unanimously. <laughs> that is a that, phrase I never thought I would That may say. be a first for the minutes. We will. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, Q no, we can't yet. We're going to re reactivate QA. Which has been done. Okay. Councillor Nicholson has the floor still. He moved an amendment. <laughs> Do you have any other bright ideas? <laughs> Well, you're still married here. We should both try and keep talking. No, yeah. thank you. There's a bottle on ice, so I mean. <laughs> Councillor Sikora. Thank you very much. You know, <clears throat> years ago, when I was the mayor, I banned pesticide use on, on the city lands in Coquitlam. The bylaw's got to be somewhere around. I'd like to take a look at it. But I had banned all pesticide for boulevards and park maintenance and everything else. What we used was steam to kill the weeds, okay? And it worked very, very well. But however, on this, you know, pesticide use for good public health, you know, I mean, you know, as if it's not going to be used, you know. You know, I, I don't know who's public health or whatever it is, but the stores have a right to sell it there. I know. You can ban it from the stores. We haven't got the power. So they can sell it. People are going to buy it. <clears throat> very, very simple. And, and use it. And how are you going to go into, into personal private property to see what they used on their gardens? You can't because you'd be trespassing. And, and also the bylaw here, it says offenses under bylaw number 4254 2012 is also authorizing additional staff from the Environmental Services Division to issue bylaw tickets. Now that bothers me. You know how many staff are we going to have issue bylaw tickets on what? I can go, you know, we've, we've had Kenny and Tyre make a presentation that's too onerous on their staff, and I understand that. So if the provincial government bans it and the federal government bans it, then there'll be no, no need of it. You know, they certainly the enforcement will be there on its own. But to somehow say that, you know, just for sake, it rolls off the tongue real easy. We're going to ban pesticide use array. We're going to slap us off on the chest and make a big deal out of it that we ban pesticide use. But we didn't. We didn't. We can't, we can't enforce it. We can't enforce it. We cannot take it off the shelves in the stores. And that's very, very simple. It's there to be, to be bought and it's going to be sold and people are going to buy it. So, frankly, I can't support this, Mayor. It's just, uh, you know, as I said, I had, we had the power in those days as council members and the mayor to ban pesticide use for the city of Coquitlam. We can do it today. No problem. I'd support it. But, this is not for the city of Coquitlam only, it's for the residents, which I can enforce. And that's very simple. And I can enforce that we are not going to be able to sell in the stores, in our stores, pesticides. So how do you enforce it? You know, but the, certainly banning the pesticide use for the city of Coquitlam, we had it years ago. Take a look at that bylaw and work like a darn and can work again. So that one I would support. But as far as the general public, I can't, you can't enforce it. Thank you. Thank you. I said this three years ago. Um, we cannot ban pesticides from Coquitlam. We can, we can make it illegal to use them. 
we can't actually enforce that one either, but we hope that a lot of people will take the cue. But we will still have the products sold in Coquitlam because we don't have the power to ban their sale. Only the provincial government can ban the sale of pesticides, or the federal government for that matter. Um, and I urge them to do their homework, get it done, and make a decision as quickly as possible because ultimately local governments don't have this authority in the way that we need it. If we want to do this, and I recognize that the courts have ruled that we could, and in fact there's legislation that we can almost pretend to ban the products because there's no one's going to be able to go out there at 6 a.m. and catch someone that is intent on using weed and feed on his lawn. Um, and that's the frustration here because every local government wants to do good public policy but good public policy is much easier to do if you have the tools. Uh, if you don't have the tools it's almost impossible to enforce and that's the case in this, in this situation. However, I was convinced that if we, as this was years ago, I guess a couple of years ago, convinced by members of council that let's assemble a team of experts and get recommendations from them and we, we said at the time we're going to get people, we're going to get experts, biologists, environmental experts, people that know what they're talking about. A panel that's irrefutable as far as their credentials. And we did that. And actually, I, I was impressed with the caliber of the people that came aboard to work on this on a voluntary basis. And, um, and every member of council was. And I remember saying at that point, OK, if we're going to assemble a panel, please, Let's accept their recommendations. Let's not second guess their recommendations. Let's not substitute our judgment if we're assembling a panel of experts. Let's not substitute our judgment because we disagree with what their recommendations were. They came back with recommendations and, and they, weren't, they were voted down. And that uh, was incredibly frustrating again because it's not good public policy if we as assemble a team of experts and then vote down their recommendations and, and substitute our judgment. We sent it back. It came back with uh, amendments, and the amendments that it came back with make it, um, well, the, quite frankly, the, the key amendment, and it was mentioned by Councillor O'Neill, the key amendment, uh, I think it was Councillor O'Neill that mentioned it, um, was lost. Um, oh, it was Councillor Reamer? Oh. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, it was you, yes. The key amendment was lost, there was a key, there was a key change, and that, and I, quite frankly, I. I don't have any stake in that change. I don't have any stake in it, other than the fact that we commissioned a group of people that knew what they were talking about. We said, you folks are the experts, tell us what we should do, and then when their answers came back, we said, we don't think that's what we should do, so we're going to do something else. I'm, that frustrates me. It uh, makes it so that I'm, I'm per fully prepared to give an exemption to the uh, Fraser Pacific Rose Society, but that exemption wouldn't have been necessary because they would have applied for a permit and uh, if it, the, the permit was, had the valid reason and the appropriate plan to use the, the, the products, the permit would have been granted. In the same way that the city would apply through the permit process and occasionally have to use pesticides in order to prevent injuries on a, on a slow mo snow molded field, for example. Um, those kinds of permits would have made this process work. And now we don't have those, so now we're exempting. And uh, to me, that's, uh, that. I, I believe we've taken a step in the wrong direction uh, with, with this because ultimately good public policy would have us treat everyone the same. Councillor Asmundson. Well, thank you very much. This has gone on a while. I always have stated that the best place for banning this is at the federal provincial level. As Mayor Stewart pointed out, but we, we, we decided to convene a environmental committee of experts to challenge with this. They came back and said we should ban it. At that point, I voted in favor to take their recommendations, move forward on the banning of this, taking their recommendations. And I, I will admit to what Mayor Stewart talked about, some frustration of their recommendations coming back about the permitting process and us rejecting that and getting, sending that back at them. Um, but they, they went back, they worked on it, they decided rather we want to get this through, we don't want to create, a, so they backed down from their recommendations. And sometimes that to a group can be a bit intimidating when council comes back at them like that. And I don't think that was fair to them. Now, I'm the chair of the Environmental Committee. We met last Thursday. As for item three, we brought up about the issues about point of sale uh, from the comments from the, one of the retailers and what was their thoughts on the issue, need for a point of sale. Uh, the discussion ranged that 
the agreement was that there was no need for information at the point of sale. Their feeling and their discussion came out that having the information on the shelf where the product was, was the best location to have it, to inform people and to stop people before they take it off the shelf to bring it up to the counter. Their feeling was that once they get to the counter, that they would ignore that anyways and carry through the line. They also didn't see any need for what the one retailer pointed out by putting the information on the bill. They, their feeling was <coughs> that people, when they get to the till and they get their bill, they're not going to look at the bill, and if they come out of the store and they do see it later, they probably won't return the product. And their feeling was also that maybe just a benefit to the retailer because it protects them that the information was there. So the committee unanimously, it will come out in the next minutes at the next, was that the recommendation by staff was the correct recommendation moving forward. And I'm going to support the recommendation of these panel of experts on the Environment Committee and their discussion on this, because it was unanimous, the members of the Environment Committee that were there on that night. Thank you. Yes. On the environment. Thank you. Councillor Reamer. Thank, thank you very much, Councillor Asmussen. That was very helpful, and I, I don't believe I, I was aware um, of that. Um, I do support um, the pesticide bylaw. Uh, it went through the process that Council um, set out for it, and we're now at the point where we have listened uh, to some groups with respect to the bylaw. And, um, and, and now we've got it down to the point where tonight um, I'm very hopeful that we will pass uh, fourth and final reading. Um, I agree with the remarks made by Mayor Stewart um, concerning the Rose Society, um, that we may not have had to have done this um, had we uh, gone with the permitting process. However, this is how it's turned out um, through a democratic process. And I'm happy to support um, the wishes of the Rose Society and, and the fact that it could take uh, some time to uh, move to the disease-resistant roses. Um, I'm also uh, going to support um, deleting the requirement on pesticide vendors to display the notice. Um, I think the example that Councillor Robinson gave actually um, depicts um, accurately uh, the fact that it is going to be problematic for retailers at the point of sale and that really it's best to have that information uh, right on the shelf, um, right next to the product or underneath it or, or wherever um, to provide information uh, for those people uh, to inform them about our pesticide bylaw. Um, one of the um, really good things that has come about as a result of this very lengthy process um, that we have gone through for the last is it two years? Three. Three years? Okay. Well, <laughs> it's the fact that this has created awareness and um, public education uh, with respect to the Environment and Sustainability Committee who um, made the recommendations concerning the bylaw. Public education was a very big thing. And uh, I think through this process, although it, it may have seen uh, seemed long. Um, it really served well uh, public awareness and, and education, and um, I'm hoping that uh, it will continue to be on the uh, forefront for everybody uh, moving forward after we pass fourth and final. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no other speakers, we might be about to finish this. Recommendation number one. All in favor. Opposed? That motion carries with Councillor Sikora opposed to the exemption. Uh, recommendation number two, uh, a two-year report back from the Rose Society on progress. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Recommendation three, my apologies, I've actually taken the clerk's role here. You want to, you want to do it? Uh, actually, no, the clerk you're, is, you're, way, you're way better the than that. The motions are moved in on the floor and, uh, and they've been read out previously. So. Okay. Motion number three. Oh, you're uh, doing a good job. <laughs> no, <you're>, <laughs> <laughs> wow, that coming from a professional. <laughs> uh, re recommendation number three, uh, uh, which is the pesticide use control bylaw number 4254. All in favor? Opposed? Councillor Nicholson and Councillor Robinson are, uh, are, well, he didn't raise his hand. Uh, Councillor, okay, he's, he's opposed to that as well. Okay, uh, that motion carries. 
recommendation number four, which is fourth and final reading after three years. All in favor? Opposed? Councillor Sikor is opposed, and Councillor O'Neill is opposed. That motion carries, and I'm almost opposed. But give first, second, and third readings. This is recommendation number five to the bylaw notice enforcement amendment. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? Councillor O'Neill and Sikor are opposed. That motion carries. Item number 10 is the 2012 Annual Tax Rates Bylaw 4305. The staff recommendations that Council give first three readings to save Coquitlam 2012 Annual Tax Rates Bylaw 4305. Moved. Moved by Councillor Reed, second by Councillor Reamer, Councillor Sikora. Thank you very much. <clears throat> to the Treasurer, number one, you have a home value at 565. I don't think there's a home in Coquitlam. If it's a home, if it's not a condominium, that's valued only $565,000. Yeah, there's a couple. Uh, through the chair, that is the, the value of the average home in Coquitlam, but that would include townhouses and apartments. You talk about townhouses and that. Well, it's the average home, so that includes average. everything. Yeah, we're, not, we're not ignoring yeah. the people in condos. Residential home, well, I'm only going by what the report says. Average residential home. To me, it's a home. If it's a townhouse, it's a different. It's a residential, but it's a townhouse. Yeah. And if it's an it's apartment, it's an apartment. It's still a home. Okay. Now, second, secondly, you got 3.16 percent on tax increase. Okay. This is excluding. Uh, this is including the uh, 0.75 that we gave the uh, businesses. Mr. Sikora, we gave a full point. Uh, to, well, one to point? Yeah. So in other words, is it, it would have been 2.616 if we didn't give the 1% to the businesses. No. That's the 3.16% is the average increase across all property classes. Council also approved a tax shift. Generally, you've approved a tax shift of 0.75%. This year, Council increased that to 1%. So what that means is for businesses, that average would break down to 3.56% for residential and 2.56% for business classes. Thank you very much. That's all I have. Thank you. Seeing none others, all in favor? <laughs> opposed? Councilor Sikora is opposed. Motion carries. Item 11 is the 2012 to 2014 Strategic Community Investment Funds Agreement. The staff recommendations that Council approve uh, this agreement with the Province of British Columbia. Moved by Councillor Asmussen, seconded by Councillor Nicholson. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Item 12 is the 2012 Municipal Police Unit Agreement. The staff recommendations that Council approve the 2012 Municipal Police Agreement as found in Attachment A of the report of the Deputy City Manager. Now on this one, um, this one of course is presented, this was a negotiation between the province and the federal government. We are not a party of that negotiation, but uh, municipalities were consulted and, uh, and we had a, a staff rep as well, uh, Mr. Dumont, that uh, participated in that uh, uh, briefing related to the, the ongoing uh, negotiations over, over a couple of years. Um, this has come back now as a contract and is subject to ratification by every uh, signatory municipality or every municipality that is uh, policed by the RCMP. And I'm fully prepared. I, I know that the Minister has given an extension for the time for uh, ratification. And I'm also fully prepared to uh, entertain um, any further extensions if Council wishes to do that. Uh, if they need further information, this is a, a complex ag agreement. Uh, I think there's been a, some, some information out in the media that conflicts to some degree with some other things that people have heard. And there was also um, uh, some financial information that came forward. Uh, and I know Council may well have questions on that as well. So why don't we uh, begin the discussion now? I see Councillor Sikora. Thank you very much, Mayor. You know, uh, there's a few things that really bother me as far as this agreement is concerned between n number one. <clears throat> the province of British Columbia is the only province that contracts the RCMP to the province of British Columbia. All the other provinces, the police force works with the municipalities directly. And how I know when I was a member of parliament, we were very short of police throughout British Columbia and Andy Scott appointed me to be go-between the RCMP in British Columbia and Ottawa. 
And so I found that out at a meeting that British Columbia is the only province that contracts the police and then they subcontract it to us and that type of stuff. We had great problems. The, I know that the one thing, the increases in salary, it's, it's something that always comes aboard. Certainly, you know, I mean, you can't have a police force that gets no increases or whatever it is. But to me, this is a five-year budget increase. And to me, if we negotiated through the union contract a tax increase that they would normally get, I could uh, support it. I'd have no difficulty with it. In other words, if, if our QP people get, say, 2 percent, so the RCMP get 2 percent. If our QP people get half a percent, they get half a percent. If our QP gets nothing, so the RCMP get nothing. I think, you know, because I think one thing that we should be doing is, you know, and some number of years ago, I remember when the RCMP was frozen for about 10 years, no increases whatsoever. That was brutal. That was brutal because then you can hire, have a problem catching up, you have a problem recruiting, and a few other things. Now, I've got many, many other things I want to talk about, but I'm going to, I certainly would like to get an extension on this one. It also says in many, many pages in here, it says the chief elected official, CEO, means the mayor of every municipality, has the say. And, and I know that, Mayor, you'd probably come to, our, to this council if there's something coming up, but there may be mayors that won't do it. So I'd, I'd suggest that all these, where it says CEO, that, be, that would be CEO be struck off and, and council be put in place, where council are consulted on every one of them. And there's many, many pages that uh, says CEO, CEO, CEO. Nowhere is it mentioned council members, and I, yet. Uh, we have many, many cities and many, many mayors, and you don't know how each mayor operates. So I would suggest that instead of the, the mayor and the minister for the RCMP in the Victoria, I would suggest that it be council. That's including the mayor and the minister in Victoria. And I've got quite a number of other things, but I myself would like to have a little extension on this, whether it be a couple of weeks or a month, so I can go through this contract uh, a little finer than what I have already done. Okay. Um, I'm actually going to try and get a clarification of one item. Uh, I'm looking at page four of the contract. I'm, uh, I'm, I recognize that we can propose amendments to the contract, but we're not going to get any amendments to the contract. Um, at C, it's uh, sorry, at uh, B, it says chief executive officer or CEO means, and then it's a whole list of people, including the mayor or other head of the municipality, however designated, and includes such delegate approved from time to time by the municipal council. So, in other words, it's council's delegate to um, is the uh, the is the intent here. Am, am I? Am, Mr. Yeah, that's by their definition. So, Mr. Dumont, is that uh, am uh, I reading it wrong? Uh, through the chair, that, that's correct. And I think, in, in terms of a practical reality of how this would work, is uh, uh, if council has feedback for you, uh, you know, you're the the conduit between the police chief and and council, and uh, you know, council can certainly give input to you in terms of. Uh, what sort of direction that we provide to the officer in charge. Just a point of clarification on uh, the wage increases for RCMP. Uh, council has no involvement whatsoever in the wage increases for RCMP and uh, have never had that. They're federal employees. Their wage increases are approved by the uh, Federal Treasury Board and they're based on federal wage guidelines and also uh, making sure that the RCMP is competitive with other police organizations. Uh, their their uh, RCMP are federal employees that are contracted through the province to municipalities, uh, so we really have no input into uh, into what the actual settlements are. Thank you, Councillor Robinson. Thank you. I, I too wouldn't mind a bit more time with this. It's a very thick read and a thick document. And uh, the particular area of interest I have is about accountability. And there's some stuff in here that I, I don't even quite understand. I'm reading in the letter which I surmise is just sort of the, uh, the truncated form of what some of the key factors are in it. And it says on page three of the letter from uh, Minister Bond that a bilateral accountability mechanism to permit operational effectiveness assessments at the municipal level. 
I, don't, I have no idea what that is. So I, I have lots of questions and would uh, move to, I guess, defer this to an, another time. Is that would be that be the appropriate motion to talk to talk more to yeah. talk through with staff I, 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 and, and Port Coquitlam in terms uh, of the there's motion. a long list of speakers, so I'm going to set, ask you to set aside. I the can motion set it aside, defer. but I'm just I'm aware of the time, and if we I, I, I recognize that. All right. uh, if anyone doesn't want to speak to it, that's fine. There there will be a motion to defer at the end of it. If we still have lots of questions, uh, that's fine. fine. If anyone doesn't want to speak to it, that's fine. Councillor Asmussen, are you? Are you Councillor Asmussen, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I went through the document. I, I read the document. Um, remember, this is a national agreement made on a national basis with all the provinces and all the agreements. And this has been going on for four to five years. There's been a lot of meetings. There's been invites for councils to come to meetings on the RCMP contract. I think what the mayor said was quite true, is that we've come to an agreement now that has been ratified and accepted throughout other provinces already. And while we may have some concerns or issues with this contract, we are not going to get something changed that is different from other provinces in this country. And this is, that's a big issue dealing when moving forward with this contract. The only thing is we don't want to deal with the RCMP contract and we don't like it. Our only option is to go to our own police force. We've done studies on that, and it's quite a bit more expensive. So while we can defer this and we can read it further, it has gone through UBCM, FCM, and has been many information sessions on this. We've had briefings on this, and we can make comments of it, but we won't make any changes to this document moving forward. Thank you. Okay, and I'm just going to, before we entertain the motion, I'm going to take two minutes, just a couple of clarif points of clarification. Ottawa can't, I mean, if Ottawa were to negotiate with each city, I suspect we wouldn't have anywhere near as much clout in that negotiation between the federal government and, and Coquitlam as we did with the province of British Columbia, which actually uses more RCMP for local policing than any other province. Most provinces don't use the RCMP in the way that uh, British Columbia does. As far as the differential wage increase, again, it's, these are federal employees, and we couldn't very well have them earn a different wage in Burnaby as they earned in Coquitlam because we had a different wage increase or things like that. So those, those really aren't on the table. Uh, in the end, this, this negotiation was primarily about, for, for British Columbia and for its police forces, was primarily about accountability and better management tools. Um, we were holdouts. British Columbia was a holdout in this one. Alberta signed on, Saskatchewan signed on, but they both signed on with Me Too clauses. So Councillor Asmundson's right. We're not getting dif different from the other provinces. They're getting whatever we got when we fought harder and fought longer. And British Columbia did uh, push very hard. We got some management tools that really change it uh, quite a bit for us, make it a little bit more um, useful in the way in which we can deal with our police force. Our rank and file, uh, our police force, our, our officer in charge is here to, today, uh, Superintendent Wilcott. These are great people. They do wonderful work in our community, and we applaud them. The management tools we were looking for were uh, better cost accounting, better ability to manage our costs, and better uh, accounting for the, the police that we do approve uh, to, for them to hire and the police that they bill us for. And so we, we have some of those management tools now. Um, the new contract gives us better management tools, and I, uh, I look forward to, to, to seeing it uh, till it happen. The wage increase that, that was announced and kind of thrust upon us, uh, we had already budgeted, and I thank our very conservative financial service for, for having budgeted, uh, having included uh, enough to budget for that wage increase. That stuff, uh, I think this new contract will allow that those kinds of surprises won't happen as often. And that's a, that's a very good thing for, for Coquitlam, very good thing for British Columbia. And so, Councillor, I'll take Councillor Robinson as a motion to um, defer this till the next meeting. Is there a seconder? Yes. Seconded by Councillor Nicholson. Any further discussion on the motion to defer? All in favor? All opposed? The motion carries unanimously. 
Next item, item 13, uh, is the QNET 2011-2012 Annual General Meeting. Staff recommendations that Council, as the QNET shareholder, receive the 2011 Annual Report, including the audited financial statements, appoint a QNET Board of Directors to serve until the next Annual General Meeting of QNET, as per the nominations contained herein, and appoint a financial auditor of QNET for the fiscal year ending December 31st, 2012, as per the recommendation. So moved. Here. Second. Moved by Councillor Reed, second by Councillor Nicholson. Councillor Sikora. Yeah, I'd like to ask some questions on, on uh, this QNET. Uh, as I read the report and financial statement, it says a $10 million profit in the end of 30 years. Uh, that's, that's a prediction. Am I correct? Well, of course it is. It's a it could be also a $10 million loss. It's a prediction. Well, it, it's, it's, it's any future financials have to be by, by their very nature. Their That's right. Their projection. Their projection. Projection and yeah. could, be, could be profit, could be a loss. Now, when we started this QNAT about five years ago, it was for 25 years. Now, how come that it went up to 30 years? How did we extend hey, it hey, an hey. extra five years? The question's been asked. Well, your Worship, uh, the business plan was always a 30-year business plan. A 30-year business plan is what Council approved in 2008. So you're telling me that in 2008, if you look at the minutes for 2008, it was a 25-year contract. It was not a 30-year contract. When did that 30 years come about? Yeah, well, this isn't a contract, but um, well, Mr. Adams. Uh, Your Worship, it's always been a 30-year business plan, and that was what was approved by Council. Okay, now, to Mr. Adams, have you gone to our, to our land management and to the planning department or to the approving officers to say that you must allow, not sell any city land unless QNAT is, is allowed, hooked up to the, to the city lands? Have you required hooking up? To uh, uh, the city has amended its uh, sale agreement for development of uh, residential MDUs in particular uh, so that um, developers will allow some space for competitive telecom services in their developments. And how did that come about by you approaching the, the land manager and also the, the uh, subdivision approving officer. Matter of fact, if I can phrase it this way, that in fact those people were told by you that they cannot sell land to the city of Coquitlam unless they are give provision to hooking up to the QNAT. And same with the subdivision people, they cannot approve any subdivision unless they're hooked to QNAT. Am I correct or am I wrong? Well, I Mr. Adams doesn't tell our, um, our no, subdivision. No, hold, hold on. I got, okay, okay. I got Mr. Adams. Uh, Your Worship, no, I certainly have no power to enforce those kinds of rules on the city lands manager or anyone else at the city. Did you discuss it with any of those departments? Uh, certainly, we discussed to making those changes, yes. To make those changes. In fact, they made those changes. Yes, they I did. I hear say so. Well, you know, to me, I find that very, very odd. It, it's not a clean operation as far as I'm concerned. Far from it. Because what you're doing, in fact, is forcing the municipality the, or the employees in our city to do something that is not an up and up. It's not, it's not can, can, legal to do Sikora, what you, you did. You're alleging that, that, that this, oh, that's I'm entirely not improper. Anything. I'm sorry. You, you just said improper. that you forced someone improper. to do something Man, illegal. That's not true. On a point of order, it wasn't proper because it was done. It was, wasn't proper because it was done. The fact is that, he, that Mr. Adams went to a department head and said you will not sell no land. Mr. Adams doesn't have control over department head. But he did. Okay. Uh, so. And I can go on another well, thing. Then now, I, I just... another question. Can I talk about the school board or not? Or is it still in camera? Well, you just talked about a personnel matter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right, and I have every right to. Well, I'm, 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 I'm questioning. 
Okay. Did, did, well, that's can we talk about the school board? No. Absolutely. Oh, what do you mean? Well, one says actually, no, one yes. Actually, um, here, just a second. In the QNET annual report 2011, uh, on page 17 of 27, it says item 3, school district 43 is expected to proceed with the first phase That's of the right. project, so it's not in which involves connecting Five 10 days. secondary schools in the Tri-Cities to a private fiber optic network. This is expected to add uh, money to the sales so, revenue, yeah. 48, 47. So it's not in camera, right? That information is public. That sentence public. Is okay. Is now, it, also, the school board had some concerns that if after they invest $5 million, that if... Okay, uh, Councillor, that information is public. Yeah. But I just read... The rest it. isn't. Okay, and, and, and uh, let's, say, let's say the school board invests a certain amount of dollars and it does not work out. That's for a guarantee from somebody. So this information that I just gave you is not in camera and the rest Everything of the information... Is in camera. You, your oath. Okay, yeah, then okay. we'll have to see the solicitors on it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Any other questions on the QNET annual report? I would want to thank staff for putting this together, and I applaud um, the great. I think there's some great directions that we're heading, and uh, I think it's 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 very promising. Any further discussion? Seeing none. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Okay. Item 14 is the Metro Vancouver Board and Brief for their meeting of April 13th. Uh, our city's representatives are here to respond to questions and the staff recommendations to receive the brief for information. I didn't catch the mover, sorry. Moved by Councillor Reamer, second by Councillor Robinson. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Thank you, Richard. That is the last formal item on this evening's agenda. Uh, uh, German has moved by Councillor Reamer, seconded by Councillor Nicholson, I believe. Uh, and before we do that, Councillor O'Neill has something? Yes, there was a, a few things that I haven't been intending for some weeks to bring before Council, and uh, this is the, the opportunity now. Is this the right time? Or do we delay again? I'm quite happy because 29 years I've been married. <laughs> I'm happy to delay it again for, for another but, week. Oh, oh wait, no a, an email from my wife's lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor O'Neill. No, I am happy to uh, delay these again. No, no, no. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, one has to do with an April 9th Vancouver Sun story uh, about something called Schedule 5 or Schedule 5, a little notice change to BC's recycling regulation which makes producers of printed paper and packaging of all kinds responsible for collecting and recycling or reusing the waste associated with their products. Now my interpretation of the story, and this was the first I had heard of it, is, is that it would have quite an impact on provincial, uh, uh, on our municipal recycling efforts. On one hand, this could lead to a major savings for municipalities as it would transfer the cost of recycling from homeowners to consumers, but it could also lead to collapse of the blue box system unless industry and municipalities reach some sort of agreement. So my message to the mayor and to one of the managers would be, are we aware of this? Are we planning for it? Have uh, negotiations begun with, um, with industry to uh, facilitate this transfer? Um, the answer is yes, we're aware of that, and Mr. Suzak is responsible for monitoring that and providing input into that system. <clears throat> it is a, a big body of work, and there will be many reviews by a variety of bodies uh, coming up, and I just asked Mr. Suzak to give a bit of information in that regard. Sure. Thank, thanks, Pete. Um, we are very much aware of it at the Regional Engineers Advisory Committee level, uh, along with uh, 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 REACT's Solid Waste Subcommittee. Uh, the province uh, initiated a regulation last year that compels producers of paper and packaged products to uh, be stewards of their products in a very similar way that the province years ago uh, mandated that uh, uh, container manufacturers, Coke cans, uh, 
uh, beer bottles, uh, uh, paints, uh, and more recently, electronics like televisions. Uh, they um, they are also mandated by uh, by the uh, sellers to to uh, take care of them cradle to grave. This is an extension of that program. Uh, personally, I think it will have a number of challenges. It's not quite as simple as other products, uh, and and there are issues to be to be very careful about. Uh, we do uh, have uh, recycling revenues that come from blue box. And we want to just pay very close attention to what what happens with this uh, with this program. In terms of process, the industry has formulated a group, uh, short form MMBC or Multi Material BC. This is an industry association that the packagers and the paper producers um, have formed to come up with a plan. Uh, and they are mandated to have the first draft of their plan on the ministers on, on the Ministry of Environment's desk sometime in the late fall of this year. Uh, as a part of coming up with that plan, they have to do public consults. Uh, so we are anticipating that this industry group that has to come up with their plan uh, will commence public consultation uh, either in the summer or the very early fall, and uh, we will be attending those sessions and uh, and reporting out. It, it is an issue, and, and it's definitely on our radar. Thank you. I'm really pleased to hear that because um, I think that as as it comes uh, more well known, there might be a lot of concern in the city about the impact of this, and it's good to know that you're on top of it. If we could just take a second, uh, Councillor Nicholson had something to add or not? I do. Thank you. It's actually been discussed at the, the two zero waste committee meetings that I've attended at Metro, so it's very much on their radar. But the issue that they're looking at is that the challenge of perhaps having MMBC running their own collection system, another set of boxes Special on the arts. side of the road, the consequent, you know, the running for, for our solid waste collection, however it's done, running a truck down the street once a week costs about the same no matter how much stuff they're picking up, right? The tipping fees and that are affected. But mm. So the hope is that MMBC will agree to contract with the municipalities to have the municipalities provide the service as they presently do, but a revenue base will flow from MMBC to the, to the individual municipalities, reflecting the producer's responsibility for dealing with the garbage that they've helped create. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I had another issue as well, and this is something else that's been in the news. Um, and I can imagine that uh, once Coquitlam residents start uh, comprehending the uh, the issue a little more, that there, there could be some concern there. And it has to do with the uh, Kinder Morgan plan to triple the capacity of their pipeline. And um, um, I know our mayor was quoted uh, in the story uh, giving a very uh, sort of moderate reaction to it. And not just, uh, I can't remember the exact words, but uh, I was wondering if uh, if uh, this is something that the city is involved in uh, finding out more about, what its impact would be on Coquitlam, because the pipeline does run right through the heart of Coquitlam, and uh, does tripling the size of that mean uh, tearing up a large section of Coquitlam, and what the impacts of that would be? Uh, who's on this file? Well, it almost certainly does mean tearing up an awful lot. There's pipelines <coughs> for gas and various other products that go across our city and utilities have the right to lay them yeah. uh, without so much city responsibility. But Mr. Suzak, uh, no, uh, Mr. I'll just Stedlin, I'll start uh, uh, and, uh, and indicate that uh, this is a large enough issue that it will be a joint uh, review between engineering and planning. There will be a variety of looks at it from a different number of different perspectives. The company itself uh, will have to do a variety of reviews and, and updates. And uh, if you recall, the, the hydro presentation that was done some time ago on the hydro transmission issue, this will be much larger than that. And there will be more updates from the company itself, but also reviews from our staff. There's issues both from a right-of-way perspective, whether or not the right-of-way uh, is large enough to fit an additional pipeline in or 
other uh, disruptive aspects, but rest assured that there will be <clears throat> a number of reviews and council will be involved in a variety of way, ways in that regard. The specific uh, people in our organization is a joint effort between engineering and planning because they both have responsibilities. Uh, I don't know if you need any more information than that. Uh, both Bill and Jim are available to that's talk good. further. Thank you. That's that's all. Thank you. Oops, Councillor Sikora is that Yeah, it? thank you. I think what, you know, uh, Councillor O'Neill is talking about is this Kinder Morgan extension of the pipeline from, it's going from Alberta to Kitimat. It's yeah. certainly not, we have pipelines here in, in Coquitlam. This is the one that's in, yeah, it's the one that's in Coquitlam, the proposal. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Seeing none others, the motion was to Adjourn. Yes. Moved by Councillor Reamer. Yes. All in favor? All opposed? Motion carries. We have um, just barely enough time for question period. <laughs> Under our council procedure bylaws, any questions on tonight's agenda? Questions? Seeing none. Thank you all for coming. Um, and happy birthday, William Shakespeare. <laughs>